Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Jack, and I am an alcoholic. Hi. I've never said anything more important than that. I'm not going to say anything more important than that here tonight. If you ever knew what it took for me to make that confession, you'd know why it's the most important thing I've ever said and that I've never grown any more in one day than my first day of sobriety. What it takes to cross that threshold, all the pain and suffering and Family woes, lost opportunities, losses of confidence. You never grow any more in one day than you do in your first day. And there was a guy around my parts a long time ago. He was called upon to carry a message one night. He started in the north end of Boston, the old north church. Crossed over the Charles River into Charlestown. He went through... Medford and Arlington, he ended up in Lexington and Concord 20 miles later. His name was Paul Revere. He carried a message. He never got off his horse and started telling people what to do. He carried a message. I came here to carry a message. And my drinking story is a lot like what happened to Christopher Columbus. He didn't know where he was going. When he got there, he didn't know where he was. When he got home, he didn't know where he had been. And he got a woman to pay for it. I had three out of four. (laughs) All the women I've been with never paid for anything. And that's with good reason. The first question most of the women I've been with asked me was, You're not a police officer, are you? Usually got to wait a second for everybody to catch up. Um, You know, I am an alcoholic. I don't keep alcohol where I live. I said that I, I recruited for the Marine Corps for 10 years in New York City. And I said that one night at a beginner's meeting. And while I was speaking at the meeting, there was a a space down the middle of the hall that separated the meeting. At the end of the space, there was a a woman sitting there, and she had a mink coat draped over her shoulders. She had rings on every finger. It looked like she could have purchased a home with every ring. And I remember she had this sad Leona Helmsley. I found out later she was extremely wealthy, but she had this sad Leona Helmsley frown on her face. looked like the primary purpose of her mouth was to have a fish hook in it. And when it came her turn to talk, she said, oh, I keep, I said, I don't keep alcohol in all my homes. And when it came her turn, she said, I keep alcohol in all my homes. I'd never want any of my friends to think just because I don't drink, they can't. And a couple of things. I'm not overly concerned with what anybody thinks about why I don't keep alcohol where I live. I don't have any homes. I do have uh, several friends that are recovering heroin addicts, and I don't know one of them that keeps a set of works in the freezer. Just in case one of their old friends stops by. You know, I'm really of the opinion that we give each other permission around here to be ourselves over a period of time. Not everybody gives that to you. Some do, most do, some don't. You always have your 10%. I was talking at a meeting in Orleans down the Cape one night. And I remember there was a guy at the back of the hall, and he was walking back and forth, and he was glaring at me. Not steering, glaring. 
And when I get through, the group, we were standing around getting ready to disperse, and he walked over and he goes, hey, Jack, can I talk to you for a second? And I said, uh, yes, you may. And he uh, called me over and he said, uh, how long have you been sober? And I said, quite a while. He said, you got double-digit sobriety? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, how come you never smile? And I said, can I ask you a question? And he said, yeah. And I said, you got double-digit sobriety? And he said, yeah. And I said, how come you never mind your own business? <laughs> There's only one time you will ever see me smile. There's only one time I smile. I smile when I feel like it. And I give other permission the right to do likewise. You never know where somebody has been. You never know where somebody's coming from. Play it safe. Let people be who they are. God does. I uh, had all the symptoms of this sickness the first time I drank. I was a 12-year-old kid. I was getting ready to play in a park league baseball championship. Uh, my mother called me up from downstairs in the morning. I went upstairs. The big kids were there. They were 15, 16, 17. I was 12. At that time, they had nine guys on the team, no DH, and they needed some. The kid that played second base had been stung by a bee in his eye, and his eye was shut. He was standing in the kitchen. They said, we need you to play for us today. So I went down the park. The place was packed. I was very intimidated by the size of the crowd. They batted me ninth. I played second base. I handled all the chances at second base, got three CNI singles, scored three runs. We won the game eight to three. After the game, they were going down the woods to have a drinking party, win or lose. When I got down the woods, the park instructor, who'd been a monumental power of example the past four summers, he was perched on top of this rock, and he was lushy, slushy, eyes floating around in his head drunk. And as far back as I can remember, I have always been petrified of drunken men and attractive women. I know I'm the only one. And I asked him for a beer, and he said, sure. He turned around, he gave me a six-pack of 16-ounce cold Budweiser beer. My buddy Tommy and myself, we walked up, we got our little space. We were standing there. Out of my peripheral vision, I saw this kid from the team come walking up. He had a strikingly attractive girlfriend. And he said, hey, Jack, say hi to Pam. And I was painfully shy. I was very intimidated by her beauty. They tried to make conversation with me. It seemed the sense I didn't want any part of it. They went away. I was glad they went away. I cracked open a can of beer. I drank half of it. Big burp. Drank the other half. Flipped it over my shoulder. My buddy Tommy is looking at me in hero worship like, Where did you learn how to do that? And I liked this. Uh, this was negative attention. The compliments made me feel very uncomfortable, indicative that I had a malady. I was maladjusted. And cracked open another can, drank it straight down, flipped it over my shoulder. I could feel his eyes upon me. This other kid from the team came walking over. His girlfriend was more attractive than the one before. He said, hey, Jack, say hi to Sue. In the time it takes to drink two 16-ounce cans of Budweiser beer, I went from someone who did not want to be introduced to someone that just knew you wanted to be introduced to me. And I sat up like a game rooster, 
and I'm talking to Sue, and she's talking to me, and he seemed to sense something was percolating between these two. And he says, uh, hey, let's get out of here. And she goes, no, I want to stay here and talk to Jack. <laughs> and I just knew that anybody that got within this 12-foot circumference of mine would have a hard time leaving. <laughs> and let me tell you why. This seeming feeling of well-being that I felt for the first time, and there's something about the first time, first time you kiss a girl, the first time you do anything, it's new, it's exciting, and there was something about the first time. The first time I was high from alcohol, and I'm a kid that was during my childhood, and my story is incomplete without telling you that I was severely abused as a child. Severely. I have scars on my body. My father took me to school in the fifth grade with a dress on. I was severely abused as a child because I couldn't learn. I had a learning disability because I was so afraid of him. So when I tell you that the first time I felt the elusive effect of alcohol, what it did for me, oh, it was a miracle what happened to me. And my story is incomplete without that. And later that day, I ran out of Budweiser. This kid had a half a pint of Bacardi rum, and I was hounding him for a sip. He finally said, all right, I'll tell you what, Jack, you can have it, but you got to drink it straight down or we're going to kill you. I said, okay, so I took it. I took the first blast. It was a little rough, but I, I stuck with it and drank the whole thing. And they're looking at me going, ho, oh. ho, And this feeling that I had of being invincible, it exacerbated, and I was completely out of myself, telling, kissing all the girls, telling everybody what a, times are going to change around here, this, that, and the other thing. And I went into a blackout. I come out of my this blackout, and two of the big kids were chugging me around, and I was vomiting so violently, I thought I was vomiting my organs. And I remember I looked down at my private area, and it was soaking wet. Obviously, one of the big kids spilt the beer on me when I was passed out. And... Somehow, I snuck home undetected. I passed my mother, went in, and all night long, I bristled with excitement. I was reflecting back on the day. The next morning, I woke up, and I reflected back again. As far as I was concerned, that had been the greatest day of my life. I couldn't wait to go out and do it all over again. And let me tell you this. I drink coffee and water every day like I'm going to be electrocuted. I don't know what type of water this is, but if I start blacking out or pissing myself or throwing up and Harry says to me, what happened, Jack? You were doing fine, and all of a sudden you started drinking that water and ba-boom, and the car. I'm going to get a lawyer. I'm taking this company to court. I will never drink this again. Nobody will ever have to tell me not to. Blacking out is a very intense emotional experience. Urinating yourself is a very embarrassing experience. Throwing up is a very intense physical experience. I had those experiences, and yet I woke up the next day and I couldn't wait to go out and do it all over again. And this time I'll make a couple of changes and get it right. I was maladjusted to life. I had a malady. I never had a shot. And the there once was a time, you know, my drinking at the end of my drinking was bad. It was bad. The first question was always, was he, was he drinking? Was he drinking? It's sad what happened to that kid. He had a lot of potential. And But there once was a time when I could go to a bar room at 8, 9 o'clock in the morning, and I'd hook up with my boys, and we'd start drinking beers, and at noontime we'd settle down and put the bets in on hopefully the football games, and we'd watch the games, and we'd bet the late games. And my buddy would say to me, hey, you want to go out tonight, Jack? And I'd say, yeah, let's have a couple more. We'll go home and get changed and go out. Okay. 
7 o'clock, he said, you want to go get changed? I have a couple more, we'll go get changed, and we'll go out. All right. 9 o'clock, you want to go home and get changed? I don't know, you think we need to get changed? I don't know, how do I look? You look all right, just tuck your shirt in, you look all right. How do I look? Pull your fly up, you'll be all right. All right, you go out. We go to some bloodbath bar, you know, bump a pool table like this. And because of my fear of women, I would get a couple of drinks and stand over by the jukebox, and I'd cop this attitude of indifference. And I'd maintain this attitude of indifference till about midnight. Then due to the waning desperation of the approach of closing time, coupled with alcohol releasing me from my inhibitions and my inhibitions about to become my exhibitions, from the still of the night would come the call of the wild. And I'd go on the hunt. I got that 18,000 mile stare on my face. I got whiskey spilt here. There's usually something flying at half mast. You know, the guacamole right around here somewhere. This girl's getting excited. <laughs> I'm your type of guy, huh? <laughs> and I don't care how drunk I was, blackout drunk, I would search the bar area for my prey. And if I saw a woman who looked like she was getting ready to pass out, or perhaps throw up, that was a signal for me to make my move. And you know, if that's all that ever happened to me, I would still be drinking. My story is about spiritual decay, like the effect water has on porcelain. Over a period of time, it almost looks like it's harmless, and then it starts to discolor it, and then it goes through the enamel, then it goes through the metal, and then it puts a hole in your soul. And when that happens to you, you know, the best way I can describe this sickness sober is it's like having a toothache. To somebody in this room right now and you have a toothache, all you're thinking about is your tooth. If you've got a spirit that aches, all you're thinking about is yourself. And you're thinking about that painful hole in your soul. Willie Nelson sang about it in a song to a woman. You are always on my mind. Instead of alcohol being, and 90% of the alcoholic's thoughts are about alcohol. I was either thinking about drinking, drinking, or at the end trying to think about not trying to think about drinking. But it was always on my mind. When the alcoholic stops drinking, this obsession returns to its real source. Soup. Me. You know, and anything can be an intense emotional experience. You know, I can walk in Dunkin' Donuts. You know, there's two or three lines and the people working and this person came in after me. And they know that they came in after me. And... Why is he being served first? This ain't right, and somebody's going to get hurt around here. Huh? Why? Because all Jack's thinking about is himself, pulsating with self. And the only force that I know of that interrupts this sickness sober is God and the practice of spiritual principles. And for the sake of brevity, I came to this program, a friend of mine, I woke up at a beach down near Tasket. I, I, I have very little recollection of the day before. This kid that I did everything with, he brought me back to where he lived and let me stay on the couch. Every day he asked me if I wanted to go to an AA meeting and I said no. One day, he came back from a meeting, and he had gotten a sponsor. And his sponsor knew him, and he knew his father. And Billy hadn't talked to his father for five years over booze matters. And he told them, you go home and call your father up. And you tell him, you're sober and AA. Just do that. He said, I don't know if I can do that, Marty. I haven't talked to my father for five years. He said, 
do that or get another sponsor. And this guy wasn't playing around. He knew the importance of that. And Billy came home, and he called his father up. And his father said, that's great, Bill. Let's go to a meeting on Sunday. And he said, okay. He hung the phone up, and he looked at me, and he goes, will you come with me? And he said, sure. And I wanted to go. I knew I belonged here. And I came to my first AA meeting. And we went to that meeting. I remember the three speakers. I remember what they said. I remember this little girl, this young lady. She was about 25, beautiful. She got up and talked for 20 minutes. She was funny, no notes. She seemed to know everybody. And I thought it was a little peculiar because she got emotional when she said her mother was active. I sort of thought that was good, like her mother's working out, she's active. <laughs> and, and I told my buddy Billy this, he goes, I'll talk to you after the meeting. <laughs> we went to that meeting. I remember there was a lawyer whom I met when I walked in. We were leaving. He said, I'll see you later on, Jack. And he said, okay. And all the way home, I really was telling, I really thought that guy was going to be standing at that meeting waiting for me. And later that day, we went to the second meeting. It was an early beginner's meeting, and I went to the meeting. And on the way back from that meeting, my friend said to me, what's the matter, Jack? I said, something very eerie is going on here, Billy. He said, what's the matter? I said, there's nothing the matter. I just know that I'm not going to drink today. It had always been a fight. That little screw was in the back of your head. Somehow I'd gone to these two AA meetings, and I knew I wasn't going to have to drink that day. I'd never felt that feeling before, and it was very weird. And I shared this with my buddy, and he said, Jack, that's the grace of God. You're just feeling it for the first time. And the book says, we are not cocky nor afraid. We haven't even sworn off. It just comes. It comes to those that are ready to reap it. You will reap what you sow around here. Nothing more, nothing less. The strongest mind-altering drug is the truth. The only thing you get away with is the truth. Oh, you can get away with lies and scams, and you can bury those things. Yes, you can, but they're buried alive, and they affect everything you do. You can get away with little cons and little hustles. Yes, we can. It's the getting away with it that becomes the curse you can't live with. Be careful of the lies you tell yourselves. They will be the hardest ones to undo. The only thing you get away with is the truth. AA quickly became the most important thing in my life. And because it has, I have stayed sober through my 20s, through my 30s, through my 40s, through my 50s. I am 60 years old. My sobriety has been continuous and uninterrupted during that entire period of time. I have never woken up, never once, and said to myself, gee, I wish I drank yesterday. And I've never had more gratitude than after a drunk dream. Because right about the time you realize it was only a dream, you feel a surge of gratitude because seconds before, you really thought you lost the gift. There's three things you can do with this dichotomous gift, sober. You can turn it inside and it will eat you up. You can turn it outside and look for trouble. Or you can change. And that's up to me, that's up to you. And you don't do anything about a problem till you admit to having one. The unmanageability in my life today has nothing to do with alcohol. The reason I can say this is because I've been sober a long time, and I've had a lot of problems. Some people are sicker than others. I am not one of the others. I've had a lot of problems, but I was sober. Can somebody give me a napkin, please? But I was sober. 
If I was drunk, I would tell you a different story. I was sober and I had these problems. Alcoholism. And, you know, the... Thank you, Jack. And the... I read a book one time. The name of the book was, I'm okay, you're okay. I got six pages into the book. I was going over the Four River Bridge in Quincy, and I threw it out the window into the Four River. I'm okay, you're okay. But, thank you, Harry. I, if I ever write a book, I know what the name of it's going to be. I'm not okay. <laughs> and you're not okay. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> Lack of power was our dilemma. <clears throat> Lack of power was our dilemma. Get in touch with the power and lack of dilemma becomes the power. My life is good today because it's not screwed up. My life is good today because there's not a lot of dilemmas in it. You know, we have a big book. We have a big book, the owner's manual. And in that book, it says, its main object... Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself which will solve your problem. I like that. I like a simple sentence, speaking it in one sentence. God needs to be more and more. I need to be less and less so I can be more and more. I row the boat. God steers I can steer any time I want to, but God don't row. I have to take my proper place. And, you know, I have a decision to make. Step three, I got a decision. Like all decisions, you got something to decide. Whether I want to turn my will and my life over to the care of God or Jack B. I am the proud new owner of a threefold illness. I have a body that's addicted to alcohol and narcotics. I have a mind left to its own devices as a magnet for crap. And I have an ego that always seems to tell me, you're wrong and I'm right. When everybody's wrong and I'm right, there's something wrong. One way will make you bitter, one way will make you better. And the choice is mine. And you know, Bill, when he talks about uh, best evidence is to twist it in black and white, and see about the stock and trade. Take a look at like anything else in life. Take a look at it. See if it's broken or if it's working. And if it's broken, how broke is it? You know, I was amazed. Like I had a resentment against Dave. Violated my trust. I shared with him of a woman that I had a romantic interest in only under the auspices that it was between me and him. The next day I spoke to him and he said, Hey, Susie Q was asking for you, but I said, Don't waste your time with Jack. He's got his eye on Susie B. And I said, Please tell me you didn't say that. You're a parent. I might be a lot of things, but I'm not disloyal. I trusted you and long story but for the sake of a fourth step, I'm resentful at Dave why he violated my trust. I was selfish. I didn't want him to violate my trust. I was dishonest. I watched him violate other people's trust by sharing it with me that he was supposed to keep in confidence. I was self-seeking. I badmouthed him. I snubbed him. I stopped talking to him. I was frightened. I was frightened of what everybody else thought of me that saw how vulnerable I was. Circle it. That's the exact nature of the wrongs. I was doing it myself, and I was shifting the responsibility for my behavior onto him. You know what's amazing? When I took responsibility for myself and my, all, my own behavior, everybody else got better. <laughs> it was amazing. 
<laughs> I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And, you know, the book says, how do you overcome a resentment? Triple A. Allow other people to be spiritually sick, avoid retaliation or argument, ask God for a kind and tolerant view. Poof! You have no power over me. I'm with the grace. I'm with the grace of God. You have no power over me. Man cannot serve two masters. If I'm serving one, I can't be bothered by the other. Oh, this is so beautiful, and it takes one twentieth the energy to work the program than it does not to work it. And you know, the arrogance, the great replacement for self-esteem when you don't have any. Character defects. Character defects are weak. They need each other. None of them can stand alone. I am never just selfish. If I'm selfish, I have to be dishonest. If I'm dishonest, I have to be bad-mouthing somebody. If I'm bad-mouthing somebody, I have to be afraid. Character defects are weak. None of them can stand alone. The solution, one person with courage, can stand all by themselves. One person with courage becomes an instant majority. A majority. And this is a process of subtraction. Remove these defects of care. Take away my difficulties. The steps work like spiritual Drano to unclog the telepathic pipe so the grace of God can come in and touch my heart and I can reverberate back out. To who? Whoever wants it. Abandon yourself to God. Admit your fault to him and to your fellows. Give freely of what you find and join us, for we shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit. I came here to give it to the fellowship of the Spirit, whoever wants it. Why? Because I work for God. The pay sucks, but the retirement benefits are out of this world. (laughs) And, you know, the... It is a process of subtraction. It is a process of taking away because we all have a gift. If you're trying to be like somebody else, you're forfeiting the gift. And remember, Oz never did give nothing to the tin man. Nothing he didn't already have. What you're looking for, you already have it. Nothing can give you lasting happiness. You have that already if you stop disturbing it. And we disturb it by trying to control things that we have no control over. And we become controlled. You know, I made amends to my mother probably 30 years ago, 25 years ago. And it was a day that... It was a... You know... There's been days in my sobriety, and I was telling my friend this. I had a great conversation with my friend this morning. And there's days in sobriety, and we've all had them, when you're so self-centered. If you just took one look at me, you can see it on my face. And I wish there was something I could just go... Wow, thank you, Lord. Got this in the health store. The day that I went in and made amends to my mother, you know, I went in, she was sitting at the table all by herself. I'm one of ten children. There's always 20 people in the house. There's always a pot of Portuguese stew on the stove. There's always a, a spear parakeet, a stray dog, something. I walked in my mother's house this particular day, and I told her I was coming. She was by herself, sitting at the table. The house was squared away. I never saw it like that before or since. And I walked in. I sat down. I said, how you doing, Ma? She said, good. 
I said, you know, I told you I'm in a program of recovery that involves a lot more than just not drinking. She goes, yeah. And I said, um, there's something I got to do today, and it's, and it's going to be hard. She goes, okay. I got in and went into the bathroom, and I started thinking about what I had to do, and I began to cry. I couldn't stop. And when I came back out, I sat down, and I said, Ma, uh, all the arrests, all the humiliations, the last time I was arrested was for five accounts of armed robbery. My mother had to put the house up. She came down to the police station with a house coat on and about four of my little brothers and sisters at her knees. I think she had something better to do. I said, all the stuff that took place in the papers and on TV and the jails and the arrests and humiliations and everything, I said, I'm, I'm here to tell you, Ma, that I'm sorry. I'm really sorry for that. It really bothers me. And, and she goes, that, that's okay. And I said... I just put my hand up, and she goes, you, you got to do this for yourself? And I said, yeah, my mother isn't that type of perceptive, but she was on that day. And I said, I just want you to tell you that I'm sorry, and I love you. My mother got up, she came around, she put her hand on the back of my head, and she goes, I love you too. I don't ever remember my mother saying that to me. Nobody had ever said that to my mother. My, no days off for my mother. She showed me her love every day of her life. And, you know, my mother passed away some a few years back. And, you know, when I was at the wake and the funeral, there was this little spiritual smirk on my face because I was just so grateful for what had happened and that I was able to tie up all these loose ends, and I just couldn't imagine having that happen without getting a chance to say I'm sorry. You know, so if there's somebody in your life, and how do you know if there's somebody in your life you need to apologize to? You know. You know. I know. Why dilly-dally? You can come up with a good reason to dilly-dally, go right ahead. If you can't, then go right ahead. You know, I came here tonight to carry a message. Every time I do one of these things, like this ain't my first rodeo, there's always a spirit in the room. And that spirit predicates how you feel what you do. You know, there's been such a beautiful spirit in the room here tonight. You moved mine. And I left the detox commitment one night, and a wise old gentleman told me, if I was faithful to the prescription of Alcoholics Anonymous, I would never appear anywhere as a patient for having this disease. And days would come when I'd be privileged to be a guest because I'm treating it. Tonight, on behalf of the Fellowship of the Spirit... I am privileged to be your guest. And as your guest, I want to say to that one someone, somebody that's new in this all tonight or coming back, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you're coming back, if you didn't see it work the first time, you wouldn't be here. I'd like for you to know that if you hit some potholes in your sobriety and all those potholes can appear to be so big, Sometimes, yes, they can. And maybe you thought to yourself, eh, big deal, so I didn't drink today. Big deal, so I didn't drink yet. Big deal, so I haven't drank for a month. My dear friend, if you call yourself an alcoholic and you didn't drink today, that's a big deal. Please don't ever minimize that. Please don't ever underestimate that. And please don't ever take that for granted. Because most alcoholics don't get one second of sobriety. May we never minimize, underestimate, or take for granted this gift of sobriety that is ours. You people have been very, 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 very kind to me here tonight. You have given me your patience, your tolerance, your understanding. You have shed on me more human warmth here tonight 
in 45 minutes than perhaps I felt as a kid during my entire childhood. And to you people, I do remain very grateful. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.